welcome to the third installment here in the Light and Life series called Deceiving Truths. And today we are going to speak about a topic that I have no doubt 100% of the people in this room need to hear. Today we're going to talk about the subject of you can't handle it all. Because I don't know one human being on the face of this planet above age 15 or 16 years old that doesn't feel overwhelmed, stressed out, too much on their plate, rushed in life, always hurried, always late, always behind the eight ball, always trying to play catch up. You know that you got too much that you're trying to handle and you're always in a rush. The meter for me is my level of annoyance at slow people. Do slow people annoy you? Raise your hand if you get annoyed by slow people. Very good. See, like right now, I'm annoyed that some of you took so long to raise your hand. I'm always annoyed by slow people. And I told my wife, one time we were behind someone in whatever, I said, if I'm ever that slow, just push me down the stairs. Just boom. Two hands in the back, that's fine with me. Finally, to show you how I'm always rush, rush, and we're always rush, rush, just this past week, it was my day off. And I needed, I picked up the kids from school. We were going to go to the grocery store just to pick up, you know, some fruit or whatever it is from the grocery store. Had nothing to do, nowhere to be. But for me, everything I noticed has to be like a race. Okay, Michael, Lizzie, who can get themselves buckled up faster? Go, go, go. Who can buckle themselves up faster? And then we drive. And of course, I got my list prepared that my wife gave me very, very good list. But she doesn't put it necessarily all in the right combinations. So before we go into the store, we analyze, okay, which item should we get first to maximize our efficiency, okay? Because you wouldn't want to get the cucumbers, then go get the milk, then go back for the watermelon. That doesn't make any sense. And of course, the most important part of going to the grocery store is choosing the correct checkout line, boys and girls. If you're like me, you don't analyze the checkout lines, you overanalyze the checkout lines. And you kind of stare at them all, and you kind of try to stand in two of them at the same time to see which one's going to move faster. As a former employee of Superfresh, okay, I used to be a cashier in a grocery store, let me tell you the trick, all right, and don't tell this to the regular people. I'm letting you in some serious insider information here. Don't just look at the length of the line. That's deceiving. Look at the people who are in the line. You don't want to stand behind talkers, okay? So you don't want to stand behind, like, sorry, not generalizing, but you'd always go stand behind a male as opposed to a female. Less likely to make conversation. The younger, the better, okay? The older they get, okay, in the advanced, more likely are to make conversation or haggle about the coupons. Your best bet is a single-looking guy with flowers. (laughs) Because he's late for something, and he's in a rush more than you are. The point is, all of us got a lot on our minds, overwhelmed, stressed. And the problem is, being stressed isn't the problem. Being overwhelmed isn't the problem. The problem is being overwhelmed and stressed and then adding more stuff onto the plate, which is what we do. We're already at max capacity, and then more stuff just keeps getting added, and more stuff keeps getting added. And this presents a problem. We're already overloaded, and we know now our boss wants us to work more hours. I'm already at max, now I need to work more. I already don't take care of myself, my doc is saying, now you got to start working out. I don't spend enough time with my kids, and now i got to do something with them before they run away from home. And now the school's starting, and i got to start helping with their homework. And t-ball season is in full effect, and now they got practices on Tuesdays and games on Saturdays. And we're already overloaded. And more and more stuff keeps getting added to the plate. And then there's that whole spiritual area, that whole spiritual realm. I know I need to read the Bible more and pray more. I go to church and attend this meeting. And it's just too much on a lot of our plates. Little video clip to show you how a lot of us go through life. This is a piece of cake. Little camping trip with the boys. Bring it on, baby. 
I'm all over it. Oh yeah, flag football? Coach Groeschel is what they call me. Oh yeah, little assignment? No big deal. I can handle it. I'll adjust that a little bit. Thank you. Baseball, you want me to back clean up? Oh yeah, have you seen me hit? Center field, watch my wheels. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, out of town trip? Yeah. I think I can do it because I can handle it. I am the gross. Oh yeah, let's play some ball. Yeah, let's go to the game. Oh yeah, got to get the girls to dance. Got to dance back. When am I going to get that done? But I can handle it all. Thank you. So I can watch the game from the 95th row. Man, it's getting a little bit harder. But good thing you're the gross. What gross? Adjust that a little bit. Whew, shopping trip? I hate shopping. Sometimes you got to do it. Hang in there. Oh, another assignment at work. Well, how do they think I can handle everything? What? But I got to play with my daughter sometime. Stuff that. Up. I know God won't give me more than I can handle. And it just ticks me off sometimes the way people want to take advantage of you, but it's just stay focused. You can do it. You can, oh, great. You want me to come over for dinner? Sure, I'll be there. Dinner? I don't have time for dinner. Could I get a little help over here? I, mean, I can do it. I can, don't give up. Focus. Focus. You can do it all. God won't give you more than you can handle. Hey, a little help over here would be nice, somebody. Focus. Oh, no. That was not good. Watch it. Oh, no. Oh. The problem in life is that that video showed the two problems. That the treadmill keeps going faster and we keep carrying more and more stuff. And as long as the treadmill keeps going faster, it's not slowing down, and more and more stuff gets added to my back and onto my plate, the crash is inevitable. And you're going to find yourself falling off the treadmill. How? I'll give you a few ways here that you find yourself when you're too busy that you find yourself out of it, first thing you find yourself out of it is out of shape physically. No time to exercise, no time to eat right. Just pick up something from the fast food on the way home. Our body was given to us by God as a temple for God to live in. And some of us need to do some major, major work on the temple of God. Some of us need to apologize for how we've been taking care of the temple of God. And we need some major home makeovers in this area if we get time. Find yourself out of sorts emotionally. Someone was just telling me this the other day. They said, by now, I should have been explaining the situation in their life and work and wife and kids. and I, uh, By now, I should have had an emotional breakdown, but I don't have time to have an emotional breakdown. <laughs> it is we find ourselves in this problem, caring too much emotionally, but we don't even have time to deal with it and sort it out in the right way find ourselves out of touch relationally. We know which relationships are the most important, and we just see those relationships passing us by, and we're kind of there every now and then, but it's not real significance, and it's not real quality, and the kids are getting bigger, the friends are moving further, the relationships just get further, and we're just watching it, and by the time we finish all our work, and all our house, and all our stuff, man, I don't have anything left, find ourselves fully spent. And of course, if you struggle with any of the first three, the fourth one is inevitable. Did you find yourself out of order spiritually? Because your spiritual life is connected to all these. And if any one of these is dysfunctional, it's going to affect your spiritual life. Not saying that we become heathens and pagans. We're still good boys and good girls. And we go to church most of the time. But then like... Our relationship with God is just like, like we say in the liturgy, as it was and so shall be, forever and ever, amen. There's no investment. There's no, like, dynamic. It's just kind of static. And we're not investing, we're not going deeper, and we hear sermons challenging us to live this holy life and live a life of purity and not a hint of sexual immorality. We say, man, I wish, but who's got the time to... find ourselves in trouble going through the motions. This topic about going through the motions, we're going to do a series in October that I'm really excited for, really, really, really excited for, and I hope you get excited for. This is actually going to talk about this subject, about how too many of us are just kind of Christians going through the motions. 
And we go to church, we pay our tithe, we do our quiet time every now and then, but basically we're just going through the motions. We're just walking on the escalator of life, but we're just on the Christian escalator that passes by church, okay, and that prays before it eats. That's it. Everything else is pretty much the same. We're just on the right escalator that goes by the church. We think that we're okay because of that. I'm not saying you're a bad person. No one here is a bad person. Every single person here wants to be better physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. Every single person. But the problem is we're just busy. It's just a busy season right now at work or, or, or you know, like there's this health situation in my family or, or, you know, Madden just came out. Like, just give me, give me a little time, you know? Like, it's just a busy season right now. If you've ever been in that situation, then you heard something the guy say in the video that I'm sure you've said before. Wouldn't give me more than I can handle, right? God wouldn't give me more than I can handle, right? Isn't that true? God wouldn't give me more than I can handle. We all say that. The Bible says it, right? Does the Bible say that? We think it says it, and we really hope it says it. And we've always just kind of said that the Bible says it. But I got news for you. I read the Bible. It ain't in there. I looked even in the back. It's not in there. The Bible says you will not be tempted beyond what you are able. Tempted. God won't give you temptation. But it never says, never, ever, ever says that you won't have more than you can handle on your plate as far as life is concerned. In fact, I think it is almost inevitable that you will have more than you can handle. And I think there's two reasons why. One, which I won't talk about too much, talk about it at the end. One reason I think God does give you more than you can handle because he wants you to learn to trust and rely on him. And the only way he's going to get you to do that is give you more than you can handle. Leave that one aside. You know why you have more than you can handle? Not because God gives you more than you can handle, but because you go out and find more than you can handle. And you go out and put too much on your plate. And you go out and overcommit. Like we spoke about last week, because we all had this people pleaser inside of us, we go out and say yes to stuff, or we want to do stuff to look, and we want to be, and we start putting more stuff on our plate, and we say, God wouldn't give us more than we can handle. Let's do a little survey. Okay? We'll do a clinical survey right here. Okay? Very professional. Raise your hand if you would say, either at this point in time, today, or over the past week or two weeks, you have felt overwhelmed or stressed out. Raise your hand. Okay, and leave them up. Take a look around. <laughs> everyone take a look around. Okay, I'm no statistician or mathematician, but that's pretty much everybody. That's not good. <laughs> that is not good. And if there's nothing else that I can beat through your head today, is all of us saying we're overwhelmed, all of us saying we're stressed, is not right. Something's wrong. We've accepted it as it's normal. Life is just busy. Who said life is supposed to be busy? Who said life has to be busy? We've accepted it. That's just how life is. And that's just the way it is. Well, that's not how God says it's supposed to be. And what I'm hoping today is we can shift some people's ways of thinking. I'm not going to solve all your problems today, but I hope that you realize that it's not supposed to be that way. And that's not God's intention. And if we're all running around like chickens with our heads cut off, we can't just accept it and say, that's just how life is, and it's just busy. We can't just accept it. I think that what we accept as normal today, God would call insane. We accept it as normal and a given. That's how life has to be. And God would say, that's insane. We need, we need a come-to-Jesus meeting. <laughs> you know what a come-to-Jesus meeting is? A come-to-Jesus meeting is one of those, it's not quiet time. It's not pray before your food. It's not listen to songs in the car. It's come to Jesus. <laughs> A face-to-face, -face, hopefully, potentially, life-changing encounter where I go with all my stuff and I say, this is how I'm living my life. This is how I'm living my life. I'm honest. This is how I'm living. And I come to him. And he says to me, that's insane. And even if you don't think it's insane, it's sinful. Something about it. I know 
there's a lot of people who's going to listen to what I'm saying today. And just like most times, in one ear, out the other. Laugh at a few jokes. Hopefully he says a nice funny story, something like that. Have a nice cup of coffee, out to lunch. Back to normal life. By Monday lunchtime, we've pretty much forgotten everything. I'm sure some people would do that. But I challenge you not to be one of those people. And I challenge you to be one of the few that I'm really, really, really praying. That's one of the few that will take a look and say, you know what? My life is not how God wants my life to be. And God even timed it that it's Labor Day, weekend, holiday, a little extra time. Kind of think about things with his come to Jesus meeting. Take Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, as your theme for your come to Jesus meeting. It says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who is the labor and heavy laden? That's all the people who had their hands up, which is everyone. Come to me, you who labor, heavy laden, stressed out, overwhelmed, too much on your plate, and I will give you rest. Not rest, but rest. You know the difference? Rest, rest. I decided, and I said this before, these four little letters, R-E-S-T, rest, right there. Everything I want in life is in those four little letters. That's all I want. That's what I want. I don't want money. I don't want fame. I don't want a car. I don't want nothing. I want rest. I want rest physically. I want rest emotionally. I want rest relationally. And God knows I want rest spiritually. That's what I want. And he says, I got it. Come to me. I give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will once again find rest. It's fun. Say it. Pretend like it. Say it. You will find rest. It's nice. And then they, oh, yeah. <laughs> but don't rest too much until I'm done, okay? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know our problem? Like, let's be honest. We don't know what rest means. We don't know what it means. It sounds counterproductive. Rest? We don't like rest. And I'll tell you how I know that you don't like rest. And I'll tell you how I know that you don't know what it means. When was the last time that you went to confession or you stood before God and repented for the sin of not taking rest? See, we do the opposite. We feel guilty when we get rest. We feel guilty when we, on a Sabbath day, on a Sunday, get nothing done. We need to be productive. We need to be doing something. What's rest? Rest is for the lazy. Well, Jesus says, I like rest. And I like to give rest. And God himself, on the seventh day after he created all this stuff, said that God took rest. We need to stop feeling guilty when we take rest. And we need to start feeling guilty when we don't take rest. Because in both the New Testament and in the Old Testament, God commanded rest. He commanded it. In the Old Testament, he gave the commandments, keep holy the Sabbath day. You need that day for rest for your souls. And in the New Testament, he says, come to me and I give you rest. The key to finding rest. Jesus gives us the key right here. He gives us always a promise which comes with like a condition. And the key right here is where it says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This idea of take my yoke. What's yoke? When the Lord says, take my yoke upon you. Yoke signifies two things. Direction and pace. A yoke is is that wooden stick that you see around the cow's necks. Okay, that yoke is that thing where if you got a big heavy thing to pull and one cow can't do it by itself, you take two cows, you put a yoke around them, and then when they're pulling, the yoke like allows both of their energies to be working at the same time. Christ says, I got a yoke on my neck and there's a spot for your head on the other side. And that's the key to finding rest. Why? Yoke signifies like in a three-legged race. Think of it that way. If we're in a three-legged race and you go west and I go east, there's going to be a, a, a lot of pain for one of us. You can't go in different directions. You've got to go the same direction. 
And the other thing that you got to do is go at the same pace. And a lot of us, some of us struggle. We go in directions that God doesn't want us to go. And some of us go the exact direction that God wants us to go, but at 100 miles an hour faster than he wants us to go. Look, when I speak about this subject, just so no one thinks I'm being hypocritical, and no one thinks that I'm, you know, just speaking out whatever. I speak very passionately about this subject because this is me. This is my thing. Like, I struggle with this one more than anyone else in the whole wide world about too much and too hard and too fast. And even if it's not physical, it's mental with me. Always working, always working. And as a priest, like, I'm not giving myself an excuse, but I got it harder than you. Because if you spend 100 hours at the office, you know it's wrong. But me, I'm a priest. More is better. Do more stuff at church. Call more people. Visit more houses. Pray more. Read more. And more and more and more. And it becomes very, very, very deceiving because it appears very good. It'll mess you up in life. I used to struggle with this. I still struggle with this a lot, but I used to really, really struggle. And I'm not saying I solved it, but I at least solved it up here, where I know what's right and what's wrong, and I'm doing my best. And that's what I'm saying. Is I'm not saying anyone's going to fix the problem today, but at least we need to change our mindset about the busyness and the pace of life that we lead. What helped me change my way of thinking is I read an article. I mean, more accurately, I scanned an article, okay? <laughs> because that was back in my busy, busy, busy doing a lot of stuff at 100 miles an hour. Scanned an article, and the article, it changed my life. It spoke about Jesus' stops. Not where Jesus went, but where Jesus stopped. And it started to bring example after example about how Jesus would walk to a place and say he's going to and fill in the blank. And then on the way, he would see someone and he would stop. And he would talk and he would listen, and he would heal, and he would preach, and he would, and then he'd go back, and then he'd see, and then he would stop. And I started to think to myself, I don't stop. I just keep going. And especially, like, some people tell me that when I walk, okay, I tend to walk kind of fast. Get more stuff done in life if you walk fast, right? And rarely did I ever think about all the things that I'm walking by when I'm not stopping. And the article said something very, 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 very nice. It talked about how Jesus was busy, but not rushed. And it said the following. It said that busyness is outside. Busyness is outside. But hurriedness is a sickness of the soul. Busy is outside. That's life circumstances. Yes, you will be busy. You will have a lot going on. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean doesn't mean that you have to be rushed and hurried. So I started to look at myself, and I realized I was rushing everything in life. In an attempt to get more done, I was rushing. I was rushing through people. Important relationships, I wasn't leaving them, but I was rushing through them, getting, trying to squeeze stuff in here and there, rushing, rushing, rushing. God, quickly, quickly, we got, we got a timetable to meet right here. And if I can squeeze you, if I can shave 30 seconds off here, I can add that 30 seconds here, and I was rushing God, I was rushing people, which are the two most important things in life. And then it hit me. I was not yoked with Jesus. I was not. I was going the right direction. I was doing everything right in life. But I was not yoked with him. I was going at a pace that was not for him. I was trying to go so fast, get a couple steps ahead of him, and prepare the way for him. I'm the prepare the way for the Lord kind of a guy. I'm going to get ahead of him. And God convicted me. And even, I'll show you how God works in like small, tiny little ways, and they seem trivial, but they're very significant. At least in my mind, that's my faith, and you can laugh at me. This was about three, four years ago, five years ago, something like that, where I had this revelation that things need to be changed. And at the time, someone gave me, this was back when they were new, a pair of Crocs. All right? And maybe you should see me wear my Crocs. Before that, I never wore sandals. Inefficient, can't go as fast. 
but someone gave me them, and of course they look funny. They're kind of comfy, but I'm like, and honest to God, I felt it was from God. God saying, where are these? Walk slow. <laughs> I'm serious. He told me, walk slow. Go slow. Now, as I say that, I thought about that as I walked up here on stage, and the ironic thing is, of course, right now, you see me wearing sneakers. <laughs> so, of course, I learned the lesson. That's why God said, okay, you can go back to the sneakers, okay? <laughs> but I learned the lesson, and the lesson is, is that we need to slow down. We need to slow down. Because if you don't slow down, you're going to walk right by the most important things in life. What is it that we should do? I'm too busy, too many things to do. How do I solve this problem? I'm not going to tell you how to solve the problem, but I want to help you go in the right direction so you know what you need to be thinking about and praying about in your Come to Jesus meeting. First principle is that you need to learn that some things need to be shared. Too much. Some things, right off the bat, need to be shared with other people. We need to let other people give us a hand with them. Back in Exodus chapter 18, Moses had a lot on his plate. He had to lead two, th two million, sorry, two million people into the promised land. And the people were just coming out of what land? Egypt. So they came with the attitude of the Egyptians. They were complainers. They were whiners. They were slow. I'm talking about the Egyptians back then. <laughs> and they had attitude problem. And Moses had a lot on his plate. And God told Moses some very good advice through the mouth of his father-in-law. said the following, Exodus chapter 18, verse 17. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. Let that sentence speak to you today. <laughs> What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. What you are doing is not good. You want me to tell you my problem? I think a lot of you share the same problem I have. Because you're good people, some things need to be shared. Yes. You got a problem? I'll help you out. You need help? I got you. You need moving? Yeah, yeah, me, anytime. Anyone who's got any problem, we're there to help them. But our problem is that we're not very good at asking for help, are we? One time I needed to record a video. Like a two-minute video or something like that. For something, I don't remember what it was. And this was back before camcorders had remote controls. I spent about 45 minutes, set up the camera, look at it, okay, and then hop in here and see, okay, that's about right. And then I would come over here and push record, and then I would come here and I'd record the whole thing and the camera got moved. So I would come back here and adjust it. I spent about 45 minutes. My wife is downstairs, like in the kitchen having a snack. And she comes up and finds me doing She's like, why didn't you ask? I'm like, I don't need any help. I can solve this. And she wanted help, and I insisted, no one will help me with this project. I would do it all by myself. Even in one minute, she could have just, boom, boom, one minute, cool thing could have been done. Another time, when I was assembling the crib for our kid, this is probably the most insane thing I've ever done. All I needed, I knew I could do it by myself. I knew I could do it by myself. I just needed someone to hold up the other side while I screwed on this side, because you can't. Did I ask anyone to come hold it up? We're taking 14 seconds. Did I ask? What did I do instead? I got all the books out of the bookshelf, and I built like this leaning tower of books and notepads to hold the thing up ever at the right angle, and it spent probably two hours doing something that my wife could have done in one second. We're crazy. We're insane. We're insane. We need to learn how to share. There's some things in life we need to ask for help for. And I gave you two dumb examples about two dumb things, but there are a lot more serious things. Emotionally, relationally, we need to ask for help. We need to realize you can't handle it alone. 
You can't do it by yourself. You need someone to help you. I joke a lot about myself and stuff like that. But in all seriousness, there are, outside of my spouse, of course, which is number one, okay? Outside of my wife. There are two very important relationships in my life, or like groups of relationships, that if I don't make time for these relationships, I'm going to not only wear myself out, I'm going to wear you out. I'm not going to be just annoying to myself and be annoying to you and everyone around me. And that is, number one, my accountability partner. If I don't make time, go hang out, have lunch, talk. Like this is never going to jump and bite itself on my face. Got to make time, keep myself normal. And then my family. Now I'm talking about my immediate family. I'm talking about like brother, brother-in-law, okay, this kind of family relationships. These relationships, if I don't make time for, and I don't, not just make time for, but invest in and give myself to, and give myself to, I'm only hurting myself. Because you can't do it all by yourself. You are not designed to do life alone. You need someone to share with. You need someone to pray with. You need someone to walk with. This is how God designed our life to be. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. You remember this verse for those who attended the retreat back in April. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is fulfilled when me and you are leaning on each other. And I'm carrying you and you're carrying me. That's how the, the plan of God is fulfilled when we are leaning on one another. And some of us need to get better at letting people share our burdens and bear our burdens. Some things need to be shared. Some things need to be stopped. Secondly, some things need to be stopped, cut out. That article that I said changed my life said that if you are too busy, then either you are A, doing things you shouldn't be doing, or B, doing things that you should be doing in a way that you shouldn't be doing them. So either you're doing the wrong things, or you're doing the right things in the wrong way. And that's what I mean by some things need to be shared, right thing, doing it the wrong way, doing it on your own, need to share it. And some things shouldn't be doing at all. And those are the things that we need to stop. All the time management books and seminars and techniques and prayers and verses will do you no good until you learn how to cut stuff out of your life. There's a story in Luke chapter 10 that I'm sure many can relate to. The story of Mary and Martha. Y'all know the story. Two sisters, good people, Jesus coming over to their house. One sister, Mary, said, you know what? Jesus is coming over. This is what I've been looking forward to. I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting at his feet. Nothing. I'm not going to answer my cell phone. I don't care if someone rings the doorbell. I don't care if the baby cries. I'm going to sit at his feet. And that's that. This is my night with Jesus. That's that. Martha did what me and you would do. Got to prepare the house. Got to vacuum the stuff. Got to bake the food. What's Jesus' favorite cookies? Got to make sure. I got to bake this and this in case he likes it. That started working. Started working. And she's working. And she sees Mary out there just sitting there. And she's Mary just sitting there, lazy bump, just sitting there. To find she can't take it no more. She's like, Mary, get your lazy butt off the floor and come here and do something productive. Why are you just sitting there doing worthless? Don't be so lazy. Be productive. Do something valuable in your life. Jesus, ever so calmly, responds back to Martha. Verse 41. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. How many of us need to hear this? Martha, Martha, you troubled you worried about many things? Chill out. Take it easy. Have a seat. Mary has chosen something, and you've chosen something else. Mary's not lazy. Mary's not a bum. Mary made a choice. Just like you, Martha, made a choice. We all make choices. 
You choose to do some things. You choose to not do other things. Life is a choice. That's economics, opportunity cost. Everything has a cost. She said yes to this and no to, and no to that. You did the opposite. You don't like the choice? You have the choice. You have the opportunity to make a different choice. This sentence, which all of us say and all of us think, how would you end this sentence? If only I had more time, I would. What would you say? I could list 15 things off the top of my head. If only I had more time, I would spend more time with my kids, work out more regularly, get on an eating, start eating right. I would be more involved with my kids' uh, my baseball. I'd coach. I'd write a book. I would uh, read the Bible more. I would serve more in the church. What would you do? <clears throat> Whatever the answer to this question is, is a cop-out. If only I had more time, is a cop-out. You got the same amount of time as everyone else. Don't complain. You got the same number of minutes and hours in the day that everyone else does. The difference is how you choose to spend those hours and minutes. But don't complain about the hours and minutes. You make choices, just like I make choices. <clears throat> the reason you're not doing those things is because you've chosen to do those things. Martha made a good choice. Mary made a better choice. See how life is? Martha made a good choice, but Mary made a better choice. What are you choosing? Analyze your life. What are you choosing? Good things or better things? Everyone does good things, no doubt. But sometimes you got to say no to the good so you can say yes to the better. Our problem is in life is that we just kind of cruise. Like I said, we're on the escalator of life. And we're just kind of going with the expectations that everyone else around us sets for how we spend our time and how we do life. And what I'm saying is we need to get off the escalator, we need to hop in the driver's seat, and we need to take control of this bad boy. And we need to stop letting life control us. We need to start controlling life. For example, for example, if you took a survey in the United States of America and you asked, what's the most important thing to people? You know what would far and away be number one? Family. Everyone would say, importance of family. Family is most important. Not, not money, it's family. It's not our house or our job, it's family. Everyone would say family. Okay, if family is so important, why do you spend 12 hours a day at work? If family is so important, why do you spend 12 hours a day at work? Why do you say it's important? But then you spend 12 hours a day at work. And two and a half hours commuting each way to work. And you don't see your kids. You outsource the raising of your kids. But family is most important. Something's not right. Your, your words are saying family is most important. But your actions are not saying family is most important. I'm not saying work is bad. Work is good. But maybe there's something better. Maybe something needs to be stopped. Maybe that new promotion that I'm selling my soul for, that just needs to go. I just need to be content with this. I don't need to sell my soul for that. I don't need to sell my soul. I need to be content. That's it. I don't need to have a bigger house. I don't need to have a bigger car. I don't need to have anything. I'm content with what I got. I need to stop that. Or maybe this career path that I'm going down, that I've chosen because I want to achieve some status 35 years down the road. And I'll sell everything in between now and 35 years. Maybe that just needs to go. <clears throat> or another example. Those who have kids, easiest thing to do is do it with your kids. This example. Okay, this applies to me with myself, my relationship with God. But we're really hypocritical with ourselves. But see if you do it with your kids. Because there's a lot, you'd be much tougher on yourself when it comes to your kids. We teach our kids the importance of God, Christian family. We'll go to church on Sunday, not like the pagans out there, okay? Don't be like the what, what parents who tell us, like the American kids, right? Don't be like the American kids, okay? We go to church. 
No dating, okay? Like, this is what we do. This is who we are. We won't be like them. We go to church. God is important. Okay? And then, for our parents with our kids, or us with ourselves, we then sign up our kids for 10,000 different activities, many of which take place on Sundays. Sunday's the day of the Lord. Don't be like the bad kids. Oh, but for this season? Oh, okay, you're in the travel soccer league? Oh, okay. Then you could take Sundays off for this, for this four or five months. Or, um, you know, this season at work, whatever. Okay, oh, yeah, God is the most important thing, but yeah, it's, it's deadlines coming up at work. It's okay if you work on Sundays. It's not a big deal. It's just a season of life. It's not the end of the world. And we start to convince ourselves that God is most important, yet we throw him to the curb in a heartbeat for a job, for a project, or for baseball games, for some dumb activity. We got our kids signed up for 5,000 activities. This is something we started doing this because sports is very important to me. So I'm all about signing my kids up for sports more than anyone. And we started getting our kid in Taekwondo and in the baseball and in the swim class, and then he's doing the music class, and then he's doing this and then all this kind of stuff. We realized, what were we doing? When did we decide that having our kid in so many activities is better than just playing board games at home with mom and dad? Why did we decide that? What made us convinced that the more activities that he's involved in, the more normal he'll turn out, and spending time at home just playing board games for free with mom and dad is a bad thing? We've lost our minds. We've lost our minds. We think that the more we do, the more we get done, the more, the more, the more, the more, the better. We've lost our minds. When did we think that relaxing on a Sunday afternoon with friends is a bad thing? Just hanging out. You know, sometimes people ask me, one of the questions I get a lot from people, especially people who, who don't know me, who don't know me well, I say, how do you do it all? How do you do it all? How do you juggle? Priest, you got the school thing that you're like busy with that on the weekdays, you got the church, you like, you go travel, you respond like emails, like people bug you, and you got a wife, and you got semi-normal kids, like, how do you keep up with all that stuff? How? how? How do you do that? You know my answer? How do I do it all? I don't do it all. I don't do it all. Do you know how many things I say no to on a day-to-day -day basis? Watch, come invite me to your house. Come, right now. Watch. Come afterwards, invite me to your house. Watch what I'll say. I'll say no. And I'll be happy to do it. I won't feel guilty about it. I used to feel guilty. Now I don't feel guilty. Because now I know that in order to say yes, I got to say no. And I don't do it all. I don't try to do it all. I used to try to do it all. I was a crazy person, and I made everyone around me crazy. And I don't got to do it all. And you don't got to do it all either. You got to learn how to say no. I don't want my life out of my control. I don't want my life out of control. I got to take control. Obviously with God, I'm not saying like I got to take control out of God's hands. I'm saying God got to take control of my life. And I got to start saying, no, I can't do that. I can't, I'm sorry. I can't go to that meeting. I'm sorry. You want me to come? I'm sorry, I can't come. You want me to visit your city and do this conference? I would love to, but I can't. I got to say no. Because the only way to say yes is learn how to say no. Very nice verse in the Bible. Psalm 46, verse 10, a verse you all know. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. You know what still means? Still means the following. It's kind of awkward, isn't it? A little uncomfortable. That was three seconds. Be still. Anytime I see my life is out of whack, 99.9% .9 of the times, the cause is I have broken the commandment given in Psalm 46, verse 10. It's a commandment, it's not a suggestion. I break this commandment, and you break this commandment. And anytime your life, you find your priorities out of whack, your life is out of whack, go to Psalm 46. You know, another way of saying be still, the original Hebrew word that means be still, the technical meaning of the word can be defined as slackened or allowed to sink. Like imagine a cord that's like stretched, okay? Be still, 
let go. Drop it. Drop it. Let it rest a little. This verse, drop it and know that I'm God. There's my translation of it. Drop it. Let it go. Chill out. Relax. Ease. I want to introduce you to a new concept that I am copywriting today. Everyone here has a to-do list. And everyone has their to-do list, to-do list. I believe that we don't need more to-do lists. We need a to-don't list. And everyone here needs to finish this Labor Day weekend with a list of to-don'ts. Things that you should don't do. Because all we do is we have our to-dos and our to-dos and our to-dos and every day more stuff jumps on the to-do list. Well, I hereby declare the initiation, the formation of the to-don't list. And I want everyone to have a to-don't list. And the to-don't list should say, when so-and-so asks this, to-don't do it. And then when my boss says, need you on this, to-don't do that either. It's on my list. To-don't do that. And you start crossing things off your to-don't list as you to-don't do stuff. It's a novel concept. It'll save your life and change your life forever, I promise you. Because if you are waiting for stuff to stop attacking you, don't hold your breath, man. Work never gets easier. Life never gets slower. Kids never become quieter. Spouses... Well, we'll leave that one aside. <laughs> I want everyone to come up with a to-don't list. Everyone needs a to-don't list. You need to add more stuff to your to-don't list as life goes on. Some things need to be shared. Some things need to be stopped. But everything needs to be surrendered. Everything in life needs to be surrendered. King David said in Psalm 62, verse 1, My soul, again here comes our word, finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. My soul finds rest in, in God alone. I'm not looking for rest in vacation. That's not my rest. In a new car, that's not my rest. A promotion certainly isn't my rest. Getting into a relationship, having kids, man, that ain't my rest. My rest in God alone. Next verse, Psalm 55, verse 2. It says, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. I love the verses that say, cast your cares on the Lord. The picture that's in my mind, I often think of myself this way. Like when someone, like I got a lot on my plate, a lot of responsibility, and a lot of people ask me and rely on me. Sometimes I feel like Santa Claus with a big sack on my back, and this big heavy sack, and cast your cares means I just come to the altar of God, and I say, you deal with it. This person is insane. You deal with that person. This problem is too big. You solve that problem. This situation has no solution. You solve it. Just cast your care. Just chuck it up there. Toss it up there and trust that he will sustain you when you do it. Once upon a time, there was a Saidi guy. Saidi guy means a guy from Upper Egypt. Okay, Saidi guy is to Arabic. Okay, well, I won't say what it is to the States. Okay. A certain state west of here. Okay, we would say the same thing about the state west of here, but leave that. A guy carrying a sack of potatoes, heavy sack of potatoes. Maybe you guys heard this one before. Carrying a heavy sack of potatoes. And oh man, he's an old guy and he's walking down the road carrying this heavy sack of potatoes. And it's too much for him, it's too much. So another guy comes driving by with a truck. So the guy with the truck sees him and he's struggling. He says, hey man, you need a ride? Guy says, oh, you know how much you helped me? Oh, I really need a ride. So he hops in the back of the truck, and the guy starts driving. 
the guy looks in the rearview mirror in the back of his pickup, and he sees the guy sitting in the truck, but he's still carrying the sack of potatoes. Still carrying it on his shoulder. So he pulls over, goes to the guy, says, man, why you don't put the sack down? The society guy says, no, man, it's too nice of you to give me a ride. I couldn't ask you to carry the potatoes as well. <laughs> I'd be asking too much. <laughs> we do that with God, don't we? We do that with God. God gives us life, gives us salvation, sanctifies us, gives us his spirit, does all this stuff for us. And then it comes the last little nugget, the 1%, the easy thing for him to carry our burdens after he's already done everything we say, no, God, I got this one. <laughs> Either way, he's carrying them. Either way, he's carrying them. It's just a matter of whether or not you carry them as well. And we need to learn how to surrender things to God. I'm not saying ask God. I'm not saying share with God. Surrender means... Not like the Saidi guy. Surrender means I come before God. I say, God, this is your problem. I trust in you. I sleep at night. I have rest. Some of us can't find literal, physical rest because we can't let go of our burdens. Literal rest. We can't sleep. We can't, we can't sit down and enjoy a conversation with our wives and our husbands and our friends because our mind is always on stuff. That ain't right. That ain't right. Not only is it insane, but it's sinful, like I'm saying. We need to learn how to surrender things to God. Remember before I was saying how the myth that God doesn't give you more than you can bear? That's wrong. Okay, remember I was saying we all think God doesn't give me more than I can bear. God doesn't give me more than I can bear. That's wrong. But you know what is true? God doesn't give me more than he can bear. God will never give me more than he can bear. But oftentimes, he gives me the weight that's too heavy to teach me to rely on him, to teach me to trust in him, to teach me to pray, to teach me to get on my hands and knees. That's the way he'll do it. I want to leave you guys here today with a question. It's a big question. And I know the initial response to this question is going to be to kind of, sort of, blow it off. And kind of, sort of, water it down. But don't do that. My question, my big question, what radical change do you need to make in your life? What radical change? If you want to be yoked with Jesus and move in the same direction and at the same pace and stop living an insane, sinful, crazy man life. What radical change you need to make. Now I can already read your minds. Your minds are saying, I don't need a radical change. I need a minor change. Just a minor little tweak. Look, you're an intelligent person. You're smart enough where if everything would have been solved, by a minor tweak, man, you'd have figured that out a long time ago. And you'd have done that, and you'd be good by now. But the fact that I said, who's overwhelmed? And everyone's sticking their hands and their feet up. Overwhelmed. Who's stressed? Or who run around like a crazy person? Everyone said it. Means that it ain't a minor change. If it was minor, you'd have solved it. If it was minor, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. What radical change do you need to make? Maybe like I said, that promotion, which you drew that promotion as eternal life. There it is. There's everything that I want in life in that promotion. Maybe you need to take that off the pedestal. And the radical change is, I don't want that promotion. I'm content. Maybe your radical change is you need to go sell your expensive card, which you can't afford, sell that bad boy, Get yourself a nice, cheap car like the rest of us, used, or get a bike, and get out of debt, and start living a normal life, and stop spending the rest of your money drowning in debt, and the rest of your life just to impress people like we talked about last week. 
It's a radical change. Maybe you need to do it. Maybe something in your life which you put this goal, this thing you're trying to achieve, maybe you need to put that on hold for now. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But something's got to give. And if something doesn't give, you're going to give. Remember the guy in the treadmill. The thing keeps moving faster, and the more stuff keeps getting added. Either you make a change, I'll leave you with this thought. As we evaluate what change needs to be made, and the big cost, and how could I, and this sacrifice, remember this fact. You will never regret sacrificing the good for the better. You will never regret sacrificing what's good for what's better. My prayer for today is that you would realize that living life the way we're living is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Enough. Continue this. Something's got to give. I got to get off of cruise control and just move it on the escalator. I got to have that come to Jesus meeting where I come to him. Listen carefully. I didn't say come to a meeting. I didn't say come to church. I didn't say even come to your Bible. Because we trick ourselves by doing these things. Come to him and say, you solve my problem. I got a big problem. You solve it. You lead me. You guide me. You show me what needs to go in my to-don't list. You show me what needs to get sacrificed. You show me what areas I'm not yoked with you. You, Lord, lead my life. Because I'm sick and tired of this life. It's not an easy thing to do, but trust me, it's worth it. When you find rest, I'm sorry, when you find rest, it's worth it. My prayer, isn't Labor Day about, what's Labor Day about? Isn't it about rest somehow? Yeah, let's make Labor Day about rest, okay? My prayer is that this Labor Day is that we would all find rest for our souls, our minds, our bodies, and most of all for our spirits. Let's stand for a prayer, please. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you have come and invited us today to come to you and offering us rest for our souls. Lord, every single one of us knows that we'll never find rest in outside things, in work, in people. All these things, Lord, the devil uses to deceive us. I think if we just get this, if we just get this, then we'll find that rest. Lord, we know we'll never find rest outside of you. So please, Lord, help us. Help us to change our way of thinking. Help us take control of our lives, Lord. Or better, Lord, help us to surrender our lives to your control so that you be really the one who's in charge and calling the shots and telling us how we spend our time and how we spend our, our, our energy, and where we choose to invest in, and what we choose to not do and not invest in. Lord, we need your guidance, and we need your help. We need you to really take control of everything in our lives, because we know we can't do it on our own. Please, Lord, bless each and every single person here, and don't let any one of us leave here, and the devil convince us that, that it's not for us, or that we don't need this message, or, or that we just need something minor. Lord, we want to live lives of rest. We want to lead lives of freedom from, from slavery to all these outside things. Bless us, Lord, and bless all those who are really in need, Lord, of finding freedom and finding rest in you today. Through our Lord and our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and with the intercessions and prayers of all your saints, hear us, Lord, as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. May the peace of God be with you all.